Lamu alayhi amma ba'du Fa inna khayr al-kalami kalamullahi Wa khayr al-huda huda rasulillah Wa sharr al-umur muhtathatuha Wa kulla muhtathatin bid'atun Wa kulla bid'atin dalalatun Wa kulla dalalatin fin nari As it's been announced, advertised Today's Daras Ikhwani is about one of the really important lessons in terms of the fiqh and the ibadat of al-Islam, and that is the etiquette of the Eid. And because the Eid is an issue that is a recurring issue in the life of the Muslim, it's something that the Muslim should not be ignorant about in order to get the most out of the Eid. I look in the audience and today for some reason Allah knows best we have a lot of really younger people in the masjid Shabbat and from our hirs with the Shabbat and for the Shabbat we encourage you guys brothers and sisters you youngsters to learn about the, the deen of Allah so that you'll be able to navigate throughout your life and you're worshiping Allah and you know what you're doing and there are many pitfalls or afat of al-ilm now is not the time to deal with those issues but don't be of the people who are arrogant they think they know everything and don't be of the people who are ignorant and they don't mind being ignorant and don't be of the people who they don't really care but take it easy and moderately go through your religion and trying to learn about what's the best way to worship Allah with sincerity. Don't be of those people who are intolerant. Someone has another position, another opinion, and his position and opinion has those people who preceded him to that opinion from the ulama from the companions and the tabi'een and the followers of the tabi'een, the imat al-arba, the four imams of al-Islam. Don't be of those people who if someone takes a different opinion from yours, but he has people who preceded him in that opinion and you get upset, angry, and you go crazy because he doesn't see the thing the way you see it. So this issue of al-Eid is an important issue. And I remind you, of the hadith of Al-Mustafa Al-Mukhtar Mushtaba Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And I give you inshallah Azujal the Bushra The glad tidings That he mentions Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Man raha ila al-masjid La yuridu illa liyat'allama khayran Aw yu'allamuhu Falahu ajr Hajj Tam al-hijjitu Anyone who goes out and he leaves his house, his place of residence, he goes to the masjid with the goal and the objective of learning good or teaching good, then he will get the reward of performing al-hajj. So we didn't make hajj this year, but if your goal and your objective was to come to learn or to give some beneficial knowledge about the deen, then we sit here and we get the rewards, inshallah, azawajal, of making hajj and we didn't even go. Plus the statement of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. There are many. Man masha ila salatin maktubatin fil jama'a fahiyya ka hijjatin. Anyone who walked to the masjid in order to pray one of the wajib prayers of al-Islam, he'll get the reward of performing al-hajj. So we ask Allah and we hope that this reward is for those of us who made the efforts with sincerity in these two hadith of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Concerning the Eid, the Muslim always has to know the importance of the Arabic language. The word Eid, Eid, and Eid. It comes from the verb Ada Yarudu to return. Something is happening over and over and over again. So the Eid in the Deen of Allah Azawajal, it is called the Eid because it's something that is going to be reoccurring. There is repetition taking place. What's the repetition? Year in and year out. 
the Muslim is going to perform the Eid and he's going to get the happiness of the Eid and the reward of the Eid and the blessings of the Eid every week he's going to get the benefit of the Eid because the weekly Eid is the Juma. the Muslims if we only knew we have more things to rejoice about more things to be happy about than we do to be upset with each other about we have this issue where we have a lot of hatred between ourselves and a lot of times the hatred that is between the Muslims has nothing to do with you don't see it the way I see it so the Eid it's been called the Eid because it is a recurring issue something that's going to happen over and over and over again first point that we want to mention when we talk about the etiquette of Eid and there are a lot of things that should be understood but we're only going to touch the surface there are so many issues should you make salat before the Eid after the Eid is the Eid something that has an, an adhan or iqama what do you do if you miss the Eid there are so many issues when we talk about the etiquette of an Eid we're not going to deal with all of that because we don't have enough time so it's your responsibility, Abdullah, you Muslims, to learn about the ahkam of al-Eid so that you know what you're doing. But from the abraz issues of the Eid, the more apparent and manifest things, first thing we want to mention is that the Eid is a rahmah from Allah Azza wa And we should look at it like that as the time approaches and when the day comes and when we experience that day. It is a ni'mah from Allah Azza wa Jalla. And we know that because of what happened when the Prophet went to Al Medina Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was in Al Medina and he saw that the Ansar, the Muslims of Al Medina from the Al Aws and Al Khazraj, they used to have their celebrations. Celebrations that came to them from their forefathers during the time of Al Jahiliyyah. So when the Prophet saw them celebrating Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or Radiallahu Anhum Ajma'een He mentioned to them in an authentic hadith that was collected by Imam Ahmed and other than him on the authority of his illustrious companion Anas ibn Malik who was from the young companions and from the ulama of the companions He said that the Prophet said to them Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam قَدِّمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَلَكُمْ يَوْمَانِ تَلْعَبُونَ فِيهِمَا فِي الْجَاهِلِيَتِكُمْ وَقَدْ أَبْدَلَكُمُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى بِهَا خَيْرٌ مِّنْهُمَا يَوْمَ النَّحْرِ وَيَوْمَ الْفِتْرِ He said to those companions who lived in Al-Medina, I came to you from Mecca. And when I came to you here in Mecca, you people had two days of celebration that you used to play and used to rejoice and used to celebrate in those two days during the times of Al-Jahiliyyah. He said, but you should know that Allah has changed and replaced those two celebrations with that which is better than it. He gave you the day of Al-Nahr, the one that we're going to deal with, inshallah, next Saturday, Eid Al-Udhiya, Eid Al-Adha. He gave you the Yawm Al-Nahr and he gave you the Eid Al-Fitr. This hadith of the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam shows a lot of things. We just want to make mention that it goes to show that the Eid is a rahmah from Allah, it's a ni'mah, and that it came from Allah and He legislated it. Both of these two Eids come on the heels of two of the greatest forms of worship in Al Islam. They come after the Eid of Al Hajj and the Eid of Ramadan the Psalm of Ramadan and fasting in the month of Ramadan they come from Allah whereas the Eid of the people of Al Jahili and Mecca and Medina and other than that America and the UK they are celebrations of kufr and shirk celebrations of oppression celebrations that even if they have a good idea behind them they are man made and if they are man made they are open and they are susceptible they are susceptible, they are susceptible to having problems. So the Eid in Al-Islam is a ni'mah from Allah. It is a rahmah from Allah Azza wa Jal. So the Muslim should look at it in that type of way. That it is a hiba, a gift that Allah Ta'ala has given the people. 
The other issue that we want to mention, Ikhwani, is that the Eid is just that. It is a celebration. It's not a day to be upset. It's not a day to have arguments. It's not a day to boycott people. It's not a day where the man is at odds with his wife, wife with the husband, relatives with relatives. It is a day of celebration. He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, mentioned in the authentic hadith that was collected by Imam Ahmed on the authority of Uqba ibn Amir, radiyallahu anhu. Yawm al-fitr wa yawm al-nahr wa ayamu tashriq eeduna ahlu al-islam wa hiya ayam aklim wa shurb He said that the Eid of al-fitr after Ramadan and the Eid of al-nahr after a hajj and the two days after the, the three days of al-Eid ayam al-tashriq he said they are the celebration or the aid for us, the people of Islam. And they are days of eating and drinking. They are days of eating and drinking. They're not days of arguing. They're not days of fighting. And they're not days of even fasting. These are the days where the individual, he shows his gratitude to Allah Azza wa And he takes the sadaqah that Allah gave him. And he takes the hiba that Allah gave him. And he celebrates in those days. So, so from the etiquette of an Eid is to celebrate. It is haram in the religion of Allah Azza wa for a person to fast on the day of the Eid. The Eid of Al-Fitr after Ramadan, it is just one day. And that's it. If you fast on the day of the Eid, you've disobeyed the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's just one day. And then the next day after the Eid of Al-Fitr, if you want to fast... The six days of Shawwal, you can begin to fast. You want to fast? Will you make up your fast? No problem. But on the day of the Eid, it is haram. You can't fast. Saturday, inshallah, on the day of the Eid. Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. These upcoming days, bidhinillah, it's not permissible to fast. And that's because these three days are the days of al Eid, the days of a tashriq. And he said they're days of eating and drinking. Another clear indication that shows and proves and indicates that the Eid are days of celebration. They're not days of enmity and animosity and problems. Is what was collected by Imam Bukhari on the authority of our mother Aisha radiallahu anha who said she was in her house and the Prophet sallallahu came in and he lied on his bed. And he turned his back away from her and she had two friends who were with her and they were singing the songs that make a pe- person happy. The father of Aisha came in, the best friend of the Prophet wasallam, the best of this ummah after Rasulullah wasallam, And he said to those three girls, Aisha and her two friends who were young, do I hear the flutes of a shaitan in the house of the Prophet wasallam?" Are you people singing like this in the house of the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam? The Prophet turned around and he faced Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and he said, "Da'huma aw da'hunna ya Abu Bakr. Fa inna li kulli qawmin Eida wa hadha Eiduna." Leave them alone, Abu Bakr. Let them sing and rejoice and let them dance. No problem. Because every group of people they have a celebration. They have a day of the Eid. And this is the day of the Eid of the people of Islam. So the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't allow Abu Bakr to make in this case what he perceived as being Al-Amru bin Ma'roof and Al-Nahi an Al-Munkar. He thought he saw something that was incorrect so he wanted to stop it with his tongue. He wanted to stop it. The Nabi said, no, this is not something that is not incorrect. This is a day of celebration. So I want to uh, say to the fathers and the mothers of our community, on the day of the Eid, we have to relax. These are the days where you buy your children new clothes, you buy your children toys. Generally speaking, we're more easy and more relaxed with one another. As the Prophet ﷺ was relaxed with Aisha and her two friends and with his friend Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. 
This is not the day of argumentation. The day when the husband and the wife are preparing for aid, and as is the case with the family when we're trying to get out to attend an occasion on time, almost always for the nikah, people are going to be late. The bride, the groom, the family of the bride, the family of the groom, the wali, the imam, people are always late. On the day of the Eid and going to the park, going to the masjid to perform the Eid, people are going to be late. We have so many things that we have to tend to, we have to deal with. When that happens, we have to relax because it's a day of taking it easy. It's not the day of argumentation. From the etiquette of the Eid, Khwani is what the Prophet showed us, and this is really important because many people may not know it, and we can be of the people who practice this small sunnah. And in practicing it, inshallah, maybe we'll be raised on Qiyam, and this is the sunnah that gets us over the hump. Is that the two Eids of Al Fitr and the Eid of Al Adha? When it comes to eating, the Prophet he did something, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For the Eid that's after Ramadan, the Eid Al Fitr, he used to make sure before he left his house, in front of his companions, in front of his household, his Ahlul Bayt, he would show them that he was eating to make it clear and distinct that he wasn't fasting. Ramadan is over, Shawwal is here, he would eat, and the people in his house would see him eat. He made it a point. So as the dad, as the mother, make breakfast. As the dad, as the mother, make sure that the children who after us are going to carry the torch of Al-Islam unapologetically, they're going to see, this is what my mother my father used to do. And even if it's not a big breakfast, like in the Eid of Al-Fitr after Ramadan, we eat some dates, we drink some water, and we roll out. But some effort should be made so that the people of your Ahl Bayt can see before the Eid of Al-Fitr, you should eat before you go to the Salat Al-Eid. Whereas on the Eid Al-Adha, the Eid for Saturday, inshallah, the Prophet did not eat. He didn't eat in the morning. Now, if your children are screaming and they're shouting and they're giving you a hard time and they say, I want to eat, I want to eat, and you say, no, just keep starving, just it's the sunnah. I'm not saying that you should do that. But as grown-ups, we should try to instill in them, this was his sunnah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That for the Eid of Al-Adha, this Saturday, he would not eat until he went and he prayed the Eid. And then after slaughtering, he would eat from the meat of his slaughter. Now obviously those of us who are going to slaughter, we're not going to slaughter with our own hands for the most part, with the exception of a few people who mujahideen are going to slaughter in their backyards and they're going to kill the sheep. I don't advise you to do that. But for the vast majority of people, we're not going to nubashir al-dhabh bi'aydina. We're not going to do with our own hands. So try to eat after the salat, after the salat. The companions of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, like Burayra, like Anas ibn Malik, they said that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for the Eid al-Adha, he would not eat in the morning until he prayed the prayer, then he slaughtered, and then they will cook from the meat that he slaughtered, and then he would eat it, and that's the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. From the etiquettes in terms of the khuruj to the salat of Al Eid, concerning the khuruj, the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam in making preparation for that khuruj, he used to take a ghusl, he used to clean himself with the ceremonial ghusl where he took a shower and he washed his old body. He sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to put on perfume. And he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, used to wear the best clothes. And this is something that the Muslims have always been upon. And each one of those issues have been established. So the individual shouldn't come to the Eid except that he made some efforts to beautify himself for Allah Azza wa Jalla. That's the sunnah of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it's a reputation against the people who believe that the Prophet of Islam Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wanted us to look like paupers and to look like bums, to be people who are aesthetic and we're against the dunya. 
He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to wear nice clothes, especially on the Friday. He used to wear the best clothes on the Eid day. And he used to tell the people, wear the best clothes on the Eid. One of the companions came to him with a very expensive set of clothing. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, I give you this. But it was made of that which was not permissible. The color of it was red and it wasn't permissible. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm giving you this so that you can wear it on the day of the Eid. He took it and he said to the man, the person who wears this won't have any portion of the hereafter. He said, you take it and you use it. The man said, Ya Rasulullah, how is it that you refuse it and you're telling me to use it? How am I going to use it and you're not using it? He said, I didn't tell you to wear it. He said, you should sell it and after selling it, benefit from the money. So the companion understood. Let me give this nice piece of clothing to the Rasul so he can wear it on the day of the Eid which was the sunnah that he cultivated the people upon. He only refused to wear the thing because of what it was made out of, the way it looked, the description of the thing. So there's nothing wrong with looking nice on the day of the Eid, having a special type of clothing that you wear on the day of the Eid. You buy something that's specifically for the day of the Eid, but also you use it for an example for the special munasibat, occasions like the nikah here and there. So that's the sunnah of our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Concerning the khuruj or going out to the salat, I want to mention ikhwani again and repeat to you in these blessed days of Dhul Hijjah, the first ten days. He mentions sallallahu alayhi wa sallam min ayamin al-amalu salihu fi hinna ahabu ilallahi min hadhil ayam. There are no days during the course of the year where the good deed is more beloved to Allah than these days right here, the first ten days these are the best days to come to the masjid. The best days to make up the psalm of Ramadan that you missed if you were a woman or you were traveling in Ramadan. If you missed some days and you didn't get them in in Shawwal, these are the best days to make up your days. Best days to say I'm sorry. Best days for Tawbah. Best days for Sadaqah. Best days for memorizing the Quran. These are the best days. And concerning these days, like tonight, and going to the Eid, insha'Allah. He mentions, Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, Man masha ila salatin maktubatin fil jama'ah, Fahiyya ka hijjatin. Anyone who walks to a prayer that is wajib, and is going to be done in jama'ah, if he walks to that prayer, then it is like the reward of al-hajj. This hadith includes the five prayers clearly, clearly. And some of the ulama of Islam said it includes the Eid as well. Sa'id ibn Musayyib, the tabi'i, who was from the seven fuqaha of Medina, he said from the sunnah of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is walking to the musalla for the salat of al-Eid. What he meant is from his sunnah is, this is what the companions did. Because the Prophet never mentioned that, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, although he did it. He didn't ride his camel, he didn't ride his horse. He used to ride, he used to walk to the Eid. So we encourage you to do it for logistical reasons and also because it's the Sunnah. If the Salat takes place outside every year for the last two or three years, we've been getting numbers that are increasing year by year, 40,000 plus in the previous Eid. Driving there is a headache. So I'm asking you brothers and you sisters, the people are responsible for getting this family to the masjid. It's better to walk if you can because we delay the start of the Eid every year because people are still getting there because of the complications that have been created because of driving. person who's coming from, high, from five ways, people coming from far distances, we're not going to tell them to walk to the Eid. But if you are in close proximity to, to Small Heath Park, then walk to the masjid, walk to the musalla, because in walking to the salat that is wajib in jama'ah, you get the reward of al-hajj. According to many of the ulama of Islam, the aid is inclusive of that. And also you'll be making things easy for the people in the blessed month of Dhul Hijjah. And Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala, also brought a chapter in his book 
that showed when it comes to the khuruj or going out to the Eid, he said that Jabir ibn Abdullah, may Allah be pleased with him and his father, he mentioned the kana yom al Eid khalif al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al tariqah. If it was the day of the Eid, the Prophet would go down one street walking to the Eid and after praying, he would come down and return to his house down another street. Scholars gave many reasons and wisdoms why. All of them are true. All of them are true. So this brother right here, he says, and he takes the opinion of those scholars who said that the Prophet walked down one street and he came down the other street so that he can give salams to the people of that street. He's correct. The little man right here, this little cat right here, he took the position of the scholars who said he walked down one street and came down the other street so that if anyone on that street needed a fatwa, needed to hear something about his religion, then he's correct as well and he is not against what he said. And then the third guy, his little brother right here, he took the position of the ulama who said he went down one street, came down the other street so that he can share in the festivities and the barakah with as many Muslims as possible showing how he was trying to always bring the khayr to as many people as possible all of that is correct but concerning going out to the Eid if you have the ability to do so and you're cognizant you're aware from your niyyah from your niyyah trying to be from Alul Hadith Ahl Sunnah and Saru Sunnah the Prophet will go down one way Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and intentionally come home and return by another way from the etiquette of Al-Eid and this is really important because it's from the most clear efforts of Rasulullah on the day of the Eid Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the issue of the Takbir the Takbir Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned in the Quran وَلِتُكْمِرُ الْعِدَّةَ وَلِتُكَبِّرُ اللَّهُ عَلَى مَا هَدَاكُمْ وَلَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ so this issue about saying the takbir on the Eid is in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah. So that you people can finish and complete the days of Ramadan. And you can finish and complete the days of Al-Hajj. And so that you will say Allahu Akbar because the fact that he guided you to this religion in the hopes that you will give shukr. So that's an ayat of the Qur'an that commands us to say Allahu Akbar and make the takbir of the Eid. Again, ikhwani, unfortunately, in our masjid, there are some issues that I think that we really need to pay attention to, quite a few issues. In this masjid of Green Lane, masjid of Al-Hadith, our women need to pay attention to tightening up the roles on the day of al Juma, especially. The men need to do that as well. In our masjid, when it comes to the taswit al-sufuf, we don't pay attention to that. In the local masjid where I'm praying, they are people of the Hanafi madhab. And it's in their religion, in their madhab, not to be feet to feet, shoulder to shoulder. You ask one of them why you're doing that, he doesn't know the answer. And some people, if you try to get close without any takalluf, he's going to move away from you, causing problems between people who are praying at the worst time. That's against the sunnah of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it's not important to us that an Imam Abu Hanifa was of that opinion or not. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the one who's going to get us in Jannah or not, following him. Our masjid needs to take care of the issue of the takbir on the day of the Eid. We're sleeping. The Yahud used to walk past the masjid of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when he would read Surah Al-Fajr, Surah Al-Maghrib Al-Isha, Surah Al-Fajr Al-Maghrib Al-Isha, and he would say, غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَوْضَالِينَ Those companions, as soon as the Prophet said, ah, they would say, Amin. And the people outside of that masjid would hear that from the Yahud. And they used to have envy from the unity and the brotherhood and following the sunnah. So the Prophet told the companions, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
Those Jews, they were never more envious of you people than the way they're envious when it comes to the Amin. So the non-Muslims used to see the mazahir of practicing the sunnah, the manifestation of practicing the sunnah. So on the day of the Eid, those companions of the Prophet wasallam, al-Hadith Haqqa, they used to make big efforts in making the Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. So again, the call here and the kalam here is to make the tanbih and the encouragement on every father of every household, especially get your little kids, the girls and the boys involved in saying Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar or whatever the dhikr of the takbir that you want to say. So the day of the Eid especially is the day of this takbir because of the ayat of the Quran and because of what the Prophet's companions used to do sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Few quick points about the takbir just like Eden. If he was in the Eid of Al-Fitr after Ramadan, he would eat before going to the Salah. Eid al-Adha, he would eat after the Salah. In the takbir of the Eid of Al-Fitr, the Prophet wasallam would say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. He would make the takbir from the Fajr of the day of the Eid. And he would do it a lot, walking down that street in his house, going to the masjid. But after he completed the salat of Eid al-Fitr, Ramadan, khalas, he was stopped at takbir. Done. It's over. Finish. But for the Eid al-Adha, is different. Saturday is different, inshallah. He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to make the takbir from the time of Salat al-Fajr on the day of Arafat on Friday. Friday morning, this Friday morning, the day of Arafat, the Fajr of Arafat, he would start that takbir. And he would not complete that takbir until the end of the days of a tashriq. So Friday is the day of Arafat, Yom al Jum'ah. Saturday is the day of the Eid. Sunday is the next day of the Eid. Monday is the third day of the Eid. Insha'Allah, the one who's in charge and responsible for the time. Saturday, Sunday, Monday, those are the days of a tashriq. The Prophet will say the takbir all of those days. Now pay attention. In the masjid, in this masjid, it happens every year. In the masajid of the Muslims, you'll find after Salat al-Fajr, on Sunday and Monday, inshallah, after Salat al-Dhuhr, after Salat al-Asr, Maghrib al-Shat, Many of the Muslims will make the takbir after the salat. And they'll do it three times. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Walla alham. Then they do it again and again, and then I said, everybody get up. There's no proof for that. Because there's no number. You want to make it 10 times, you want to make it 20 times, you want to make it 100 times, you sit there, you make it as many as you want. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, Making this takbir is the sunnah or is highly mustahab to do it at the salat. With all due respect to Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah, with all due respect, love, and honor, there's no dalil for that. And the people of the sunnah and the people of the hadith, as Al Imam al Shafi said, it is the consensus of the Muslims once something has been established by the Prophet. Then everyone else's statements that go against what he said, we don't take it. Abu Hanifa, and Imam Malik, and Imam Ahmed, Imam Shafi, Rahimullah, with all due respect, they got it right many of the times, most of the time, but they got it wrong sometimes. Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he got it wrong on this time. It was ijtihad. He said that this is highly recommended after the prayers during these days, after Eid al-Adha. There's no delil for that. What the delil shows us is when you wake up in the morning, inshallah, Sunday after the Eid, Sunday after the Eid, you wake up in the morning, you walk into the masjid, on the way to the masjid, Allahu Akbar, Allah, you make that dhikr. When you go into the masjid, you pray two rakahs before the imam comes out, you make that dhikr. After the imam comes out, you sit there 
and you do what the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When the poor people came and say, Ya Rasulullah, the rich people ran off with all of the rewards. They make hajj with their money and we can't make hajj. They make umrah with their money, we can't make umrah. They make jihad with their money, we can't make umrah. We can't make jihad. He said, shall I not tell you something? If you do it, you'll get more reward than them and just as much. They said, what is it? He said that you say, subhanallah, 33 times, alhamdulillah, 33 times. And that you say, Allahu Akbar, 35 times. After the five prayers, you'll get the reward of those pilgrims and the people making umrah and the people making jihad. After you do that dhikr, you do your tasbih. Your Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Do it as many times whenever you want. You go into your house, you do it. You bring your kids. When you get into the house, you sit them down and you do it. Because of the command in the Quran, as well as the sunnah of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Another issue, you young brothers, concerning the statement, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Ummat al-Islam. There is no hadith in the dunya where the Prophet told us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what to say for the takbir. There is no hadith in the dunya. He didn't say, say this. He didn't say, say that. The only way we know what to say is what the companions brought us. And that goes to show the integral role that the companions pray and play and practice in this religion. For the people who say, I only take the Quran, you are stuck, you're in trouble. You're not going to know how to do the aid. For the people who say, I take the Quran, the Sunnah, you're stuck, you're in trouble. You're not going to practice this religion correctly. The correct way is, I'm going to take the Quran and the Sunnah and try to apply them and understand them the way the companions of the Prophet understood them and apply them, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa radiyallahu anhu ajma'in. So no one is going to bring us the takbir, the seeghu to takbir in the Quran. How? What to say? No one. Quran doesn't tell you that. It comes from the companions. And the companions gave us different things. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Walillahi alhamd. So that's what most of the people do. Although it seems that the most authentic ather, the most authentic statement from the companion is the statement of Sanman al-Farisi. May Allah be pleased with him. Sanman al-Farisi that companion who was from Persia who told the tabi'een he told them kabbiru say Allahu Akbar and then he told them how to say Allahu Akbar he told them to say Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar kabira that's it Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar kabira that's it so if this brother is saying Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar Kibira. And this one here is saying Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Walillahi alhamd. He is not going to look at him, nor is he going to look back at him and they're like this. Because that's the nature of this religion. There are different ways to do different things. Now this example that I just gave you This is one of the examples Why we hate each other He's doing something one way And he's doing something the other way Both of them have proofs And both of the proofs are authentic And he looks at him As if he's doing something crazy And he looks at him as if he's doing something crazy And the thing that Both of them are doing is from the sunnah If neither one of them did it They're not sinning And then the the nar, the fire of enmity and hatred and animosity, it ignites between us and we don't give salams and we break off and so forth and so on. Any person with his right scruples, his aql, any person, his right mind is going to say, hey, I don't have to be upset with that guy. Maybe I didn't know that that was from the sunnah. Just go ask the guy, he's going to tell you. Concerning the etiquette of the Eid, and there are many, Khwani number six, is that the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for the Eid of Al-Adha, Saturday, inshallah. 
he used to make it early. The companions would pray Salatul Fajr, and then after praying behind him, they would make their way to the Musalla, Eid al Adha. They would pray behind him. So, obviously, before coming for Fajr, they would have made their ghusl. They would have put on perfume and nice clothes. They got behind him. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. They sit there, they make the dhikr, or they don't make the dhikr because they want to get there and get in the first row. After Fajr, they will make their way over there. So, the salat of an adha should be played immediately, very quickly. Whereas the salat of an Eid for Ramadan, after Ramadan, is after, is delayed. And the wisdom for that, again, is a principle in Al Islam, and that principle is Allah wants to make things easy for you, and He doesn't want to make things difficult for you. Things have not been made difficult for you in your religion. And that's the topic of the khutbah of the Eid. That's the topic of the khutbah of the Eid, inshallah. The ease of Al Islam. Islam doesn't want any of our youngsters to throw their lives away by taking a trip to any place in this world where they take their passports, Canadian passports, American passports, British passports, rip them up and burn them and step in the fire and say, I denounce my citizenship and now you have no way back. That's not our religion. Islam wants to make things easy for you. So he would perform the salat of Al-Adha, Eid Al-Adha quickly so that the people would be free to go and to slaughter. Make the salat and then go ahead and go and slaughter and hurry up, go and slaughter so that you can bring that meat back to your family you have a good time. Start your celebration ASAP, ASAP. Whereas the Eid of Al-Fitr, the Eid of Al-Fitr, he used to delay it. He made it later on in the day. Why? He made it later on in the day because from the Eid of Al-Fitr is the issue of Zakat Al-Fitr. Zakat Al-Fitr. Zakat Al-Fitr is the Zakat that every able body, every family has to spend. Zakat Al-Fitr. So that the poor people would be able to receive the Zakat to have fun on that day. So if that prayer was made right away, then they would be left out of the box. Every year on the day of the Eid, Ikhwani, I'm going to lead the people in the Salat of the Eid. People come out of the Saf, they come up to me, and we're trying to get prepared for the Eid. They say, hey, I have some money I want to pay for Zagat al-Fitr. Every year we have that. Hundreds of pounds, if not thousands of pounds, people want to pay on the day of the Eid. So if we pray the Eid right away, that money, khalas, is with them. They miss the boat. So for the Zakat of Al-Fitr, you can pay the Zakat of Al-Fitr a day or two before the Eid. But you have to pay it on the day of the Eid before the Salah. But for the Eid Al-Adha, slaughtering, he used to delay it. He used to make it quickly so that people could hurry up, go and slaughter, come back and spend the rest of the time with your family. Concerning that slaughter, concerning that slaughter, it is not permissible for any individual to slaughter, slaughter before the Salat of Al-Eid. So those of you who have made the Tawqil, you have contacted your family members in the countries where you come from, you have to be absolutely sure that you make it your business to tell them, slaughter the animal our time after this and after that. Slaughter it our time. Give them an extra hour and a half, two hours. There was a man from the companions radiallahu anhum who slaughtered his animal before the salat and he asked the prophet ya rasulullah slaughter before the salat he told him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam shatuka shatu lahmin your animal sacrificial animal is just extra meat it's just meat for your family you have to slaughter again and that goes to show a person has to have good intentions he wants to go to another country to fight jihad 
and he wants to be brave and he wants to be sincere and he wants to rip up his passport because he wants to help Islam I say that his bravery and his sincerity inshallah is praiseworthy but he has to bring the uh, second part of the equation has to be in accordance to the sunnah has to be done correctly so in this case if the person slaughtered the animal before the salat with sincerity it is not accepted as the slaughtering of the Eid because he did it in the wrong way. He did it in the wrong number. He did it in the wrong mode. He did it in the wrong place. So make sure if you have designated someone to slaughter for you, it should be after the prayer that we make to the best of your ability. Which brings us to the last aspects and parts of our presentation. And as I mentioned, there are many things from the ahkam of an aid. Many things, many things. But just to deal with some of the more apparent ramuz, the symbols and things that we need to be known and doing. In regards to the slaughtering, the slaughter is wajib upon every single family, every single member of the household. Every family here, he should slaughter if he has the ability to do so. Prophet mentioned sallallahu alayhi wasallam anyone who has the ability to slaughter and he doesn't do so then don't come to the salat of an Eid anyone who has the ability and he doesn't do so he's stingy he's not going to do it whatever he said don't come to the salat of an Eid the meaning of that is just to show the danger of having the ability to do it and you don't do it having the ability and you don't do it so every father you have to slaughter. And the more you slaughter, the better. If you slaughter a camel, it's better. If you slaughter a cow, it's better. And concerning the slaughtering of the camel and the cow, multiple people can go in on that one cow. Multiple people can go in on that one camel. You, your auntie, your cousins, whoever, whatever the situation is. If the father and the mother... They both want to slaughter. No problem. The more the merrier. And as we mentioned a number of times, in slaughtering Ikhwani, since we're going to make people responsible for slaughtering for us, don't send your money to this organization and that organization if you can help it. If you have relatives who are poor where we come from, they have more right to receive your slaughter, especially if they are really, really in the dirt. Our brothers who are in Gaza, our brothers who are in Iraq and Syria, some of them have some serious problems. So if you want to slaughter and give the meat to them in a reputable, reputable organization, no problem. But if you have family members who are similar to them or close to that, then you should send it to your family because your family has more rights that you give them sadaqah. And you get the double reward. The reward of the sadaqah and the reward of Connecting your ties of relationship. If that's difficult, then no problem, no problem. Give it to whoever it uh, is easy for you to do it. And the people of our locale, the people of our locality, they have more rights to receive your sadaqah than the people outside of our locale. Another thing, and we can't take this for granted, this is the first Eid al-Adha for some people, and the person didn't know about slaughtering, the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah, these months, and we started Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. This is the fourth day right now. Saturday night, Sunday, Sunday, the fourth day. Fourth day. He doesn't know. He's a brand spanking new Muslim. He just started practicing his religion. This is the fourth day. He said, if the 10 days of Dhul Hijjah comes and one of you wants to slaughter, then don't cut your nails. Don't shave your hair. Don't take any hair off of yourselves. Don't take any hair off. The way the woman grooms herself, she takes hair off of her arms, off of her legs. The Whatever grooming we do, take the hair off of our pubic, the pubic spots. Don't take any hair off. Don't take any nails off, any of that stuff until after you completed the slaughtering, until after you completed the slaughter. Concerning the slaughter as well, Ikhwani, Saturday, inshallah, is the day of the Eid. If you can't slaughter on Saturday because you have to get to work, because you didn't find a wakala, a group that's going to do it for you, an agent, no problem. 
You can also slaughter on Sunday. Saturday, you have to slaughter. Sunday and Monday, you have those three days. So if you can't slaughter on the day of the Eid, which is Saturday, inshallah, then no problem. You have until Sunday and Monday. Again, what's that a sign of? Akhi, that's a sign of how Allah wants to make things easy for us in our religion. Allah wants to give us room. I got an email today from brothers who come to our community. It's from Lithuania. He's a young brother. Started studying in Egypt. And then they had the spring of the Arabs there in Egypt. And it shouldn't be called the spring of the Arabs. It's the winter of the Arabs. The fitting of the Arabs. Nonetheless, he stopped his studies and he had to go back to Lithuania. Lithuania is a rural country. Everything is rural. They don't know anything about Islam. If you can imagine you going there with your wife, white people there in Lithuania, they don't know anything about this deen. It is the responsibility of that guy to take it easy, that brother to take it easy. If everything that comes out of his mouth to those people, his relatives and neighbors is, that's a haram, haram, haram. The people are going to say, Al-Islam is a religion, too many rules and regulations, everything is haram, is difficult. And the religion is not like that. There are rules and regulations but the one who knows his religion, he knows how to live and how to function in the way where he doesn't feel that this religion made undue stress on the human being. The people of Bani Israel, when they wanted to make Toba, if one of them wanted to make Toba, he would have to kill himself to make Toba. He would have to kill himself, annihilate himself, get rid of his life. So those ayahs in Surah Al-Baqarah, those ayat don't make it difficult for us don't hold us responsible when we make mistakes when we forget don't put a burden on us that we can't handle Allah said okay I've done that I won't do that to you so the religion is easy the religion is easy we're going to open up the floor inshallah in today's class because there are a lot of issues concerning this we are, um, we'll give you an opportunity, inshallah, for the next 15 minutes. you have any questions concerning the ahkam of the Eid, only the ahkam of the Eid, we'll deal with that, inshallah. Any other questions, we're not going to deal with that because we want to give people opportunity, bi'idhnillah, to know what to do and how to do those particular things. So if you brothers or the sisters can write the uh, questions, they can drop the question through this window that's by the member or maybe send one of the little sisters through the back door Akhi Amr, is that door open? if someone could get the question for the sisters little sisters can come down where the sisters have their shoes and the questions can be passed over Aywa, Akhi, Tfadl the young brother what's your name? Hassan is asking concerning Saturday's Eid. Do we have to pay the zakat of al-fitr for the Eid Saturday? And the answer is, Allahumma la. There's no zakat for the Eid, for al-ud al-adha. What is respons the responsibility of every household? He has to slaughter. The father has to slaughter. That household is responsible for slaughtering. As for the zakat al-fitr, that's only for the Eid al-fitr after Ramadan. Akhi. Good question, Akhi. This is a very good question from one of my best students, Jazahullah Khair from Africa with the afro concerning what we hear that they tell us that when you slaughter there are certain parts of the animal that you have to give away certain parts of the animal you can't give away there has to be a certain distrib distribution of the animal what's the sunnah the sunnah is ikhwani, that the animal should be divided into three parts three parts the animal that you slaughter as soon as for you to slaughter the animal with your own hand, and it's permissible for the woman to slaughter as well, 
Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi slaughtered with his own hand and he slaughtered multiple animals. And when he slaughtered those animals, he said, these slaughters are for Muhammad and the family of Muhammad and those people from his ummah who don't have the ability to do it. La yukallifullahu nafsin ila wus'ahai. You don't have the ability, the Prophet slaughtered for you on your behalf. As for you coming and slaughtering for the Prophet, don't do that. Don't you slaughter for the Prophet ﷺ. Because Abu Bakr didn't do it, Umar didn't do it, Uthman didn't do it, Ali didn't do it. No one from his Ahlul Bayt slaughtered on his behalf to say, I'm slaughtering for my father, I'm slaughtering for my grandfather, I'm slaughtering for my... None of them did that. He slaughtered for you and that's it. So the distribution is a third of the animal should go for your Ahlul Bayt, the slaughterer. Another third, the second third. And this is why you young brothers' mathematics are so important because they have every, they touch every part of your religion. If you don't know what a third is, you're going to be in trouble. So a third goes to the family of the slaughterer. The second third, two thirds. The second third, it goes to the relatives, trying to bring the relatives and the relationships together. Silat rahm. And the third third goes to the poor people. The third third goes to the members of our community. Now, if you want to keep all of that animal, no problem. If you want to give all of that animal away, no problem. As for the organs of the animal, you can't give the liver away or you have to give the liver away and the intestines and so forth and so on. There's no delil for that. It goes back to the culture. Where I come from, if you give the people in America the liver, they're going to be upset with you. Don't give them the liver, don't give them the brains, don't give them the heart. Give them the shoulder, give them the parts of the animal, the lamb that's eaten. But where you may come from in Africa and Pakistan and the Arab world, then no problem to live in these things, no problem. People in Sudan, in Sudan, they take that liver and they make it raw. And the people eat that uh, raw meat early in the morning. It's part of the celebration of the... Uh, um, can you give the slaughter for the deceased? Allah mentioned in the Quran with ta'awun on al-birri wa taqwa. Cooperate with each other on al-birri wa taqwa. So it's permissible to slaughter on behalf of people who are dead. Your mother, your father, your relatives, people who you oppress them, you owe them money. It's permissible to slaughter on their behalf. People who you misappropriated their haqq, and you can't go to them and say, I'm sorry, because it'd make a bigger fitna, slaughter on their behalf. There's no problem in that. Akhi, Ab wow. Abdul Hay, our brother Abdul Hay. Faddan ya Akhi Abdul Hay. Good question, Akhi Abdul Hay. If you come to the masjid, if it rains, I don't know what the forecast is on that day. But if it rains and we pray in the masjid, you should pray the two greetings of the masjid because you shouldn't, chukran little man, you shouldn't come into a masjid and sit down until you pray two rakat. You're going to pray the two rakat because you entered into the masjid, not because of the Eid. If the Eid is outside, you go and you sit down. There are no sunnah prayers before the Eid. There are no sunnah prayers after the Eid. For those people who come late for the Eid and you miss the Eid altogether in Jama'at, you got there late, then you pray two rakat right there by yourself. Two rakat. You pray two rakat right there by yourself. If you come late for the Eid prayer and you miss one rakat or the people in the tashahud, tashahud after two rakat, you join in them like you would join another, any other prayer and you just complete it the way that is done. So if the Eid is outside, don't pray to Rakat at all and don't pray to Rakat after the Eid. Someone may say, but it's the time for a duha it's the time of an Ishraq. Yeah, that's the time. But the Prophet didn't do that there at that time. When the Imam comes in for the khutbah to Juma, he comes in and he sits down on the mimbar and he doesn't pray to Rakat to greet the masjid. He sits down. 
Why? Because that's the Prophet. What's what he did? He didn't pray to Rakaz to greet the Masjid at that time. So the Sunnah is to leave that at that time. It's the second question, Akhi Abdul Hay. If a person uh, makes a tawqil and he deputizes people in another country who are living in another time zone, should they slaughter on their time zone or your time zone? For you to be safe, let them slaughter on your time zone. But you have to figure out the logistics of that issue. If it's not easy for them to slaughter on your time zone, then you do not groom, groom yourself until you got news from them through WhatsApp. WhatsApp. It's one of the times when WhatsApp is really, really, really beneficial. We did it. And that's it. So WhatsApp right here is a ni'mah from Allah Azza wa Jal. Because it's not like it was 15, 20 years ago. They can't call us. We can't call them. They live in a village. It's not like that. They're in the village. It's not like that. So you just have to make sure to the best of your ability. Okay? Akhi Karim. What's your name? Hamid Qureshi. Where are you from? No, no, originally. We always tell our little brothers, say, where you from? He says, UK. We say, man, you from Somalia, man. And then he says he's from UK. And then the big guys come and say, Toronto. Okay. But what part of Toronto? I mean, originally, originally. Before Toronto. India. Fadl Yaqi. Muhammad Qureshi. No, the Udhiyah for the children is not required. Good question, Akhi Muhammad from Toronto. The Zakatul Fitr, the Zakatul Fitr, that's after Ramadan. The little guy right here has to do the Zakatul Fitr. The little infant who's a week old, two weeks old, has to do the Fitr. The infant was born today, on Saturday, if it was Eid, as Al Fitr, Eid al Fitr, Zakatul Fitr, that little infant baby, two days old, he has to do Zakatul Fitr. The baby that's in the stomach knows the katal fitr because that's not in the language of the Arabs that the janin is a tufl. No zakat in the, in the stomach. But everybody else has to do it if they have the ability. For the uthiya, one slaughter for each household. And again, this message is what? Islam is easy. It's easy. Any more questions, Ikhwani? Akhi Bashir. Of course, of course. Seven people can go in on a camel. They can be friends. They can be relatives. No problem. Um, people who are coming together. The brother wants to know, uh, when you want to slaughter a camel, you want to slaughter a, a cow, a big animal, what's the description of the slaughterers? Do they have to be family members? Do they have to be all men? Do they have to be all women? If a person is Quraysh, does he have to do it only with Qureshi people? He's a Sayyid. He only does it with Sayyid people. No. It can be any combination. As long as they're Muslims and the people are cooperating, then there's no problem. Akhi. Akhi Amr, what time is the Salat in the Musalla this year? Inshallah, 10 o'clock. Nine o'clock. Don't eat. The brother's asking, you said that you shouldn't eat until you pray the prayer. And the prayer is at nine o'clock. If it's outside, seven o'clock. If it's raining, we're going to pray on the inside. So some people are not. 7.30 on the inside. Let's get that right. I don't want anybody to hear this and say, okay, seven o'clock. Well, the earlier, the better. 7.30 in the masjid, nine o'clock in the park. So if we're going to go to the park, it may be a bit difficult for some people not to eat. He's on uh, uh, insulin. The person is on a particular diet. Or just our system with our children the way we are. If you eat before you go, it's not haram. It's not haram. Kulu washrabu. No problem. Eat and drink. No problem. It's no problem. It's just the sunnah was the other way. So we're not going to bang on about that the way we will bang on about 
the takbir. The takbir, we're going to say, hey, hey, let's do that takbir. Because the takbir is an issue that we want to stamp in the psyche of our kids. We want them to feel the way they feel when Christmas is, they're being bombarded with Christmas in the school and so forth and so on. So one of the ways that they'll remember is the takbir. As for the eating and things like that, it goes back to each individual. Everybody knows the situation the best. Any more questions, Akhwani? Akhi. Concerning the prohibition, Akhwani, of cutting your nails and uh, trimming your hair and grooming yourself, is that for everybody? No, no, that's for the people who only want to slaughter, only want to slaughter. And one of the benefits of that, uh, yeah, one of the benefits that we get from that is our religion came and explained to us all of these minute details about how to worship Allah, cutting your fingernails and your toenails and trimming off the mustache and all of these. Our religion told us about all of that. So you can rest assured, Akhi, you young brothers and sisters, all of us, our religion definitely clarified to us how to deal with he says she said how to deal with the prophet's birthday sallallahu alaihi wasallam how to deal with slaughtering for the prophet uh, on the day of eid al adha our religion explained to us how to get divorced how to get married everything that we need to know everything the confusion just comes when we don't know and we do it another way any more questions ikhwani fi We take these last three questions from people who already ask questions very quickly, inshallah. Akhi, tfadlam. Yeah, if you're going to pay someone to slaughter on your behalf, then don't cut from your nails on your fingers or your toes. And don't take any hair off of any part of your body, any part, that you don't have to do so. If you go to the hospital, for an example, la samah Allah, if you went to the hospital, you have an appointment in the hospital these days, and they want to put IV in your arm, or they want to put something on you like the EKG machine or something like that, and they want to trim the hair, a small portion, no problem, no problem. Because it's necessity. But you don't groom yourself in any shape, form, or fashion for these days. So this makes your situation similar to the pilgrims. Who when they perform hajj, the men have a ihram, a towel on the top, a towel on the bottom. Once they go into that sacred state, they don't trim their fingernails, toenails. They don't take hair off. And that's it. You're similar to them in that. I'm happy you brought that up. As for the person who's here in Birmingham and he wants to slaughter, he doesn't trim his fingernails or take his or her hair off, but you can use perfume. The pilgrim can't use perfume. You're not like him in that. You can use perfume. And you can also have relationships with your wife during all of those 10 days. The pilgrim can have relationships with his wife during those 10 days. So we're similar to them, those who want to slaughter only in the nails and the hair. So some people stretch it out the way they stretch out the black dog and the black cat. The black dog is a shaitan. So when the Muslim sees a black cat, he says, A'udhu billah, A'udhu billah, the black cat. You say, what's wrong with the black cat? He took the hukum of the black dog and he put it on the miskeen black cat. And it's two different situations. There's nothing wrong with the black cat. Nothing wrong. That's superstition. Okay, those last three brothers. On the Eid day, and then the three days after that, the days of Tashrib. My man right there. If a person is going to uh, do the qurbani or the dhabh or the ulthiyah, 
through an organization that he makes um, his um, agent, how do you know that they're going to do it? That's your responsibility, your responsibility to do the due diligence to make sure. And if they turn out to be fraudulent and they rip you off, you still get your reward because that was your knee. But you have the responsibility to try to hit the target. The man came to the masjid and he gave sadaqa to a lady who was a prostitute. The Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the people say, hey, he gave the money to a prostitute. The next day he came and he gave sadaqa to a man who was a thief. The people said, what's wrong with him? He gave the money to a thief. Third day he gave the money to a man who was rich. They said, what's wrong with that guy? He gave money to a rich people, person. All three of these people don't deserve. The man said, well, I hope the money that I gave to the prostitute will stop her from what she's doing. And I hope the money that I gave to the thief will stop him from what he's doing. And I hope the money that I gave to the rich man would encourage him to give money. So the man who gave that money is not responsible. He did it best that he could. He didn't know the details and the secrets of the people. Allah is the knower. Last question right here and it's befitting for one of my favorite students from the brothers and then we deal with this from the sisters. As I mentioned, Ikhwani, concerning the issue of slaughter, and everybody has to look at his own situation. Some of the countries where we come from, it's probably more wisdom, more beneficial to slaughter on their behalf because poverty here in the UK, and we have people who are poor, but the poor person here is not like the poor person where we come from. It's not like the poor person from the places where we come from. So you have to look at all of those variables and dynamics and take them into consideration. Slaughter in here, you may not be able to do it yourself. You slaughter over there, they'll be able to do it on your behalf. You know where the money went, you know where the meat went, and so forth and so on. So everybody, look at his situation. Last question from our sisters, not to leave them out. If you are a person with a large family and it's difficult for all to get ready for the prayer in, in the morning, is it permissible for them to have um, their own... Um, Aid prayer at home despite having a mosque locally. First of all, the Eid Salat is done in the Musalla, it's done in the prayer area. Sheikh Nasruddin al Albani wrote a book about that, encouraging the whole Ummah. Hey, the Eid is for the Musalla. And the Masjid Green Lane, alhamdulillah, uh, are offering this opportunity for the larger community, the community at large to come out 40,000 people last time alhamdulillah the masjid should only be used out of necessity praying that in the masjid is against the sunnah we don't say it's haram it's against the sunnah so if people have a difficult time get into the masjid uh, get into the musalla there's nothing that says they all have to go at the same time but everyone has to get there and unfortunately in the Asian community in the Asian community and I have to mention this not as a uh, dig at the Asian community, but in the way of clarification and advice, beneficial knowledge for you and me, giving it, receiving it. In the Asian community, sometimes a masjid does not even have facilities for the women to pray. They don't even have facilities. And the women wake up on the day of the Eid not wanting to go to the Eid. It's not part of what they do. She never been to the Eid. She doesn't know anything about the Eid. And the man supports that. That's in many of the Asian community. Bangladeshi Asian community, Pakistani, but especially Bangladeshi Asian community. This is not a dig at you. This is to say to you that our Prophet Muhammad told our community, everybody should come out to the Eid, even the women, all of them. And if a woman is on her period, if the woman is on her period, he said, she should come out as well. But let her stay away from the prayer area. Let her not pray with the people. Let her sit in the back. Let her sit in the area. But even that lady. So we have to kill and destroy and demolish that cultural practice that is 
in contradiction to the religion. As for the people who don't have the ability, old people, they're bedridden, they're sick, they can't go, they have to work, things like that, then they're the people of La'va. We ask Allah to give us the means and the ways to continue to take advantage of these days, these blessed days of Dhul Hijjah. Continue, inshallah, to make jihad, to make the dhikr, to make peace, to make islah, inshallah. Those of you who are young, from the besties, it's birr wadi deen during these times. Deal with your parents and give forgiveness for your parents and so forth and so on. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika wa shadu wa la ilaha ila ant. Astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, Akhi? You never call me back, Dawood. You call me, right? Dawood is your name?